There and back again. A Goggin's Tale, Part 4. Rivendell to Lothlorien. And so, with the members of the Fellowship appointed, preparations were underway. True to his word, Goggins assisted both the elves and dwarves with demonstrations and the technical details regarding his weaponry. The elves were captivated by the accuracy, efficiency, and range of his bows, or, as he referred to them, his firearms. And the dwarves, well, as expected, they were positively aroused at the effectiveness of his armor. His body armor was lighter than a mithril shirt, but more effective than mithril chainmail reinforced by a chestplate in protecting the wearer. The elves also took a keen interest in his military uniform, particularly his camouflage clothing. More cunningly woven and more potent in its concealment than the cloaks of Lothlorien, remarked one elf. An army clad in such garb could pass unnoticed even by elven eyes. Thus, they began immediately replicating the camouflage colors across their own armor and clothing. Gandalf had explained that due to Goggin's intervention and his swift aid in expediting the hobbits from the Shire, they had arrived in Rivendell much earlier than anticipated. Indeed, said Gandalf, were it not for your help, David, it may have taken several more months for the ring to arrive here, by which time it may well have already been too late. And because of your defeat of the Witch King, it is likely that the remaining ring wraiths have retreated, gathering back in Mordor. It'll be months before they would dare resume their pursuit, if they even dared at all, now that fear of death has returned to them. The Fellowship's departure was set for the 1st of August, far earlier than Gandalf had originally expected. Of the company, only Goggin seemed upbeat about finally starting the mission. He had spent the last six weeks training a unit of elves in covert warfare, accompanying Aragorn on several stealth missions that turned into raiding parties attacking strategic targets and enemy supply trains. Goggins took this opportunity to reveal his last surprise, hidden in his duffel bag, his Barrett 50 caliber rifle. With it, he took out a couple of trolls and an important looking Uruk from a distance of over a mile away. The elves once again marveled at the capabilities of Goggin's weaponry. Unfortunately, an elf who inadvertently sat too close to the barrel lost his hearing due to the loud gunshot. He wept with great sadness, knowing he would never again hear the singing and soft music of the elven harps. Using his dark complexion, which Gandalf humorously described as overly ripe, Goggin smeared dirt on his face and donned orc clothes taken from a fallen enemy. Disguised as an uncommonly large Uruk, he infiltrated Isengard, assassinating several captains and sabotaging several weapon forges. That night, the victory feast and merrymaking in Rivendell was particularly extravagant. The offer of marriage to an elf maiden was once again proposed to Goggins, but once again declined on the grounds that he preferred the bad bitches. Goggins pondered the advantages he could bring to both sides in the coming wars. Recognizing the time it would take to replicate modern weaponry and the imminent threat of attack, he needed to find some quick wins. He advised Elrond that it was strategically foolish for the elves to remain at Rivendell, considering its distance from Isengard. Goggins urged Elrond, the elven lords, and Gandalf to adopt a more strategic approach and temporarily abandon Rivendell. The elves could reinforce the strongholds most vulnerable to attack, providing cover that would distract the enemy from the Fellowship's movements. Anticipating the first strike on Rohan, Goggins proposed sending a thousand skilled elves to reinforce the region. They might even seize an opportunity to strike Isengard before Saruman's forces reached full strength. Drawing from his study of historical battles and war strategy, Goggins discussed the Roman Testudo formation and Greek phalanx as models applicable to their situation. He discussed these at length with Elrond Gloin, Aragorn Boromir, and the High Elves who were present. These are bold formations, said Aragorn, observing the rough sketches Goggins had made to illustrate these concepts. This is going to be a badass army, encouraged Goggins. Additionally, as this was a united war for Middle-earth against common enemies, Goggins thought it was an inexcusable oversight that men, elves, and dwarves hadn't consider how best to fight effectively together, complementing each other's strengths while covering weaknesses. He then called upon the elves, 
dwarves, and men present to provide troops so he could assemble a special forces army. This heavy shock unit would consist of 500 men forming two central phalanxes, complemented by dwarves in support positions, capable of protective testudo formations and 500 elven archers for long-range attacks. The units would be attired in armor based of his own design. Light, but incredibly durable. He spent the next weeks before the Fellowship was to depart, drilling his new regiment of 2,000 soldiers into fighting together as an effective unit. Training began at sunrise and continued well beyond sunset. The plan was agreed. This regiment would be sent to Rohan, along with the Elves of Rivendell, departing a month after the departure of the Fellowship on their quest, once armor and weaponry had been crafted. And finally, he instructed the Dwarves on how to create mustard gas, which would be extremely effective in decimating large numbers of closely packed infantry. Be careful with that shit, he warned. Not even the hobbits were spared from Goggins. To harden the halflings, Goggins demanded they too complete the training alongside his special forces regiment and survive the Hell Week. Their training needs to prepare them for the mission ahead. Goggins informed a concerned Gandalf. They need to be prepared for all terrains. We should also expect cold exposure, water immersion, high altitudes, and covering large distances at speed while avoiding detection. How can Mordor be any worse than this? Complained Sam, his face covered in dirt. To his repeated misfortune, he was once again overheard by Goggins, who took the opportunity to reinstill discipline within his ranks by once again beating down the fat little hobbit, causing even the dwarves nearby to wince. This ain't the place to be a motherfucking pussy roared Goggins to the troops assembled. That little fucker's earned you all another 500 push-ups. Get to it, motherfuckers. The sound of groans exploded around them. Fucking halflings, Merry and Pippin heard one of the dwarves nearby grunt. What about the hobbit's gear? Asked Aragorn later that evening. They can't fight for shit, so they're gonna need to stay out of trouble and engage the enemy from a distance, Goggins replied. Their body armor should be ready soon, and once it's here, they ain't taking it off. Those little bitches gotta get used to wearing that shit. I also got pistols made for them, 22 caliber. Should be useful in tight spots. Aragorn nodded, then turned to Goggins again. And what about the elf Legolas? Is there anything you can do for him? Goggins looked over at Legolas and extended his hand, motioning for Legolas to hand over his bow. He inspected it closely, then shook his head with a sigh. I'll be honest with you, man. This is a piece of shit, Goggins said frankly. How far does it shoot? Maybe 200 yards max? Yeah, we're gonna switch this out. Lucky for you, the dwarves just sent over a care package based on the specs I gave them. We call this a semi-automatic rifle, similar to an AR-15, firing 80 grain armor piercing rounds. These babies will reach up to 2,000 yards plus. The magazine can hold up to 40 bullets. It's got a silencer and variable range scope. He handed Legolas the new rifle, then turned his attention to their designated beast of burden, Bill. I think Bill here is going to need a refit too, Goggins remarked, looking thoughtfully at the pony. We're going to need plenty of ammo and equipment on this mission. So either we get a couple more ponies, or we'll have to carry the rest of this shit ourselves. On the morning of departure, the air in Rivendell was heavy with the gloom. The Fellowship gathered at the courtyard, armored and equipped for the journey ahead. Goggins stood at the forefront, his presence commanding attention amidst the elves, dwarves, and men. He surveyed the group with a critical eye, ensuring everyone was prepared for what lay ahead. All right, listen up, motherfuckers. Goggins began, his voice cutting through the murmurs of the assembled company. Today, we embark on a serious fucking mission. Now this shit ain't gonna be easy. We're gonna face some fucked up shit out there. Taliban, ISIS, North Koreans. He paused, locking eyes with each member of the fellowship in turn. But none of that matters. We got a motherfucking job to do, and we're gonna do it. Ain't no room for bitch-ass niggers. Trust in your training. Trust in each other. 
We got this. Goggins' words filled them with conviction, bolstering the resolve of those gathered. Gandalf nodded approvingly, recognizing the fire in Goggins' speech. With final preparations, complete and farewells exchanged with Elrond and the Elves of Rivendell, the Fellowship set out, heading south towards the lands of Holland, with Goggins at the head setting a ferocious pace. Days passed in vigilance and weariness as they navigated through forests and the mostly flat lands of Holland. Their new camouflage gear gave them excellent cover against flocks of birds spying out the land. After five days, they arrived at the Redhorn Pass at the foot of Caradras, its looming peak shrouded in cloud and snow. It is our good fortune that we are still in summer. In the winter, Caradras would likely have been nigh on impassable. That being said, it will still be a difficult journey, said Aragorn. Gandalf, his brow furrowed with apprehension, surveyed the mountain. Caradras has always been a perilous crossing, he muttered, his voice barely audible over the rising winds. But we stand absent choice, lest we chance the road under the mountain and endure the long dark of Moria. We do not know what evil sleeps beneath the mountain, cautioned Aragorn. I would not go that way until all other roads are attempted. Gandalf paused in thought before responding, what does the ring bearer say? But Goggins cut in. Man, fuck the ring bearer, he roared. Y'all need to stop being such pussies. This shit's less than half the size of Everest. I'd conquer this hill in an afternoon. Then it is settled, said Aragorn swiftly before anyone could object. Boromir held up a hand speaking openly for the first time since their departure from Rivendell. Each of us should carry a faggot of wood, as large as he can bear. I was born under the shadow of the White Mountains, and know something of journeys in the high places. Ain't no faggots up in this bitch, exploded Goggins. Gimli, get your punk ass here. Yes, my lord, said Gimli, hastening to Goggins' side. You a stout motherfucker. Go cut down those trees. Yes, my lord, responded Gimli, hastening to follow orders and fell the dead trees Goggins pointed to. Who's gonna carry the logs? Said Goggins a short while later, next to the pile Gimli had chopped. With that, the fellowship began the arduous ascent, feet sinking into the deepening snow, muscles straining against the unforgiving slope. Goggins led the way, his experience in harsh conditions proving invaluable as he guided them through treacherous paths. Hours stretched into eternity as they fought their way upward, battling not just the mountain's fury, but their own exhaustion at trying to keep pace with Goggins. Yet, with each step, they drew closer to the crest, their spirits buoyed by the knowledge that eventually the path would become a descent. Eventually, after hours of grueling climbing, the Fellowship reached a point where the path narrowed and the terrain became increasingly rugged. Large boulders and fallen rocks blocked their path, leaving them at an impasse. We can't go around, Legolas observed, scanning the sheer cliffs that flanked their route. We must find a way through or go back. Gandalf furrowed his brow, deep in thought. There is no way to clear the path, unfortunately, he said grimly, eyeing the heavy rocks obstructing their path. I fear we may have to go back. Man, fuck that, said Goggins, stepping forward. He reached down to his belt and pulled out a grenade, a weapon the likes of which the Fellowship had never seen. What in the name of Durin is that? Gimli exclaimed. With a swift motion, Goggins placed the grenade at the base of the obstruction and pulled the pin. Fire in the hole, he shouted, motioning for all to move back. The explosion reverberated through the mountain pass, sending debris flying and clearing a substantial portion of the blockage. What sorcery is this? Gandalf muttered, his eyes wide with fear and amazement. Never in my long years have I witnessed such power, but it seems we have our path. You ain't never seen Harry Potter? Asked Goggins, confused at how easily Gandalf was impressed. Harry Potter? Repeated Gandalf. Brow furrowed in thought. I am not familiar with this sage. Now, that motherfucker got spells. He killed Voldemort with just a disarming spell. Powerful, he sounds, 
this Harry Potter, said Gandalf. Dudes, got skills. I'll give him that. He came back from death just to kill the Dark Lord. He returned from death to continue the fight? Noble, is this great wizard and superior is your world to our own in many ways, my good David. Nah, this ain't nothing, man. We got nukes and shit where I'm from that could turn Mordor into Hiroshima. And what of your leaders? Asked Gandalf. We got Biden trying to make America gay again and Trump grabbing bitches by the pussy. Great meaning do I perceive within your words, brother, said Aragorn, who had been listening intently to their conversation as he helped the others kindle a fire. But you are wise beyond our comprehension. I got a Bachelor of Science in Nuclear Engineering from Berkeley in 1989. Then you are over a thousand years old? Gasped Aragorn in wide-eyed reverence. It was the year 3018 of the Third Age in Middle-earth. He is not of this age, said Gandalf wisely, continuing to mistake Goggins for one of the Valar. That explains why your speech is so foreign to our ears, my Lord Goggins, said Aragorn. Gimli! called Goggins. Yes, my lord. Start a fire with those faggots. Yes, my lord. They all sat and rested by the fire, warming their hands and feet and enjoying the scenic view before them. They would take a short break to rest before beginning the final stage of their journey across the mountain, the descent. We made it, gasped Mary in relief as they touched down on the other side of the mountain, slumping to the ground with weariness. Good work, men, Goggins shouted as they finally reached the foot of the mountain. The fellowship was exhausted, but in good spirits at finally leaving behind the harsh cold. We have conquered cruel Caradras in a single day. We are truly flying. Let us now set course for the lands of Lothlorien, said Gandalf. Thanks for joining us on this adventure. If you enjoyed the journey and are eager for more wild fan fiction, don't forget to hit that like button, share with your fellow fans and subscribe for more episodes. And if you're as enchanted by the idea of Middle Earth meeting Hogwarts as we are, make sure to check out our series exploring this magical crossover. Your support brings these worlds to life. Until next time, keep the fantasy alive.